I'm Nick Henry, creator and writer of London Gothic. Hi, I'm Mike Burton, the uh, illustrator on London Gothic. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. If you type in London Gothic, you'll find us there. We've also got a website, which is www.london-gothic.co.uk. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to another interview on the show where we are joined by very talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. So who are our guests today? Our guests today are two very talented people, of course, creating an amazing comic called London Gothic. We are joined by the ever-talented Nick Henry and Michael Burton. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, good. Good, thanks, mate. How are you? Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> doing good, doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm Mike Burton. I'm the illustrator for London Gothic. It's my first real major comic book. I've been illustrating all my life, really, professionally for probably the last five years, four or five years, something like that. I'm the writer and the creator of London Gothic. I've never really written anything before apart from this. Yeah, it just comes from a really warped mind, I think. Well, I think you have to have a little bit of warped mind if you're a creative person, right? Definitely, definitely. I think mine's a bit more warped than most people's as well, if you read it. <laughs> Which I have to admit, I, I did get to read it. I Thank you for sending me a version of it, so I appreciate it. I thought it was well done. It's up my dark and gothic alley, so I do love the fact that you've written it in a wonderful era that you have. But looking at the world that you've built here, tell us why this world was important to create for your your twisted mind for the series. <laughs> it's some characters that I've had since I was a little kid, really. When I was young, I used to, um, I come from a really uh, sort of poverty-stricken part of London. We were quite feral as kids. So we used to run right and go around all these different places and uh, like down the River Thames. And when I was young, a long time ago, <laughs> they, they cobbly streets and things like that yeah so i used to make up these characters tell my my mates stories and sort of scare the shit out of them really been with me all through the years and even when i had my kids i used to tell them the stories of some of the characters that i had that i developed like we've got one called the soul creeper that used to creep along rooftops and check if your kids are asleep and if they weren't asleep then he'd come in and get them so you know it was things like that and i was always good to my kids <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was only later, really, I've sort of developed the characters and stories through the years, but it was more when we were going to go into the lockdown. And my wife said to me, if you don't do something with this story soon, you're going to just, you're going to pop your clogs and no one's going to know about it. I decided I thought I'd get it down and start writing it. So I had to teach myself how to write. I decided to go for a graphic novel because I couldn't write a a proper novel it's not my thing i'm not that intelligent <laughs> so i thought well what's the what's the way i can do it so what goes in here comes on the in front of people i thought well graphic novels the way to go and i taught myself how to do the uh the scripts and, and stuff like that and once it was done then i had to look for an illustrator and then i found mike luckily enough so how did you find him i found him on, the, on an upwork on the upwork site mm -hmm. website I went through quite a few different illustrators, but Mike, he's, he's got the great story of it. I tell you, it was, uh, he, he just stood out and he was on my wavelength. I think he's not as, he's not as sick minded as me, but he's getting there. I think I'm having that influence <laughs> on him. Yeah. You tend to get PTSD working on the uh, London Gothic a bit. But... <laughs> <laughs> like I said to you, I've never written anything. It was really weird because when I started to write it, it all came to me. And I always say that the devil made me do it. I don't know how I did it. It just came and all the characters and the story all was just there. And it took about four months. I've written all four chapters. They're all done. I know and Mike knows how it pans out and ends. No one else does at the minute because they've got to buy the books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if that isn't the best way to market a series, I don't know what is, you know, that's, that's perfect. Love it. So then Mike, when it comes to when you first met Nick and you first saw this on, on Upwork, what was the first thing that popped into your mind as soon as you started your initial conversation about this amazing series? Uh, Ron, I think. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so the first time uh, 
I saw it on Upwork. I was just looking for any sort of illustrating <laughs> illustration jobs. Nick had put a very, very brief sort of summary of the thing that he was looking for. And I think it was just along the lines of it's a graphic novel. It's set in Victorian London and it's a horror. And I think that's, that's literally what it was. And I thought, that's pretty cool. I'm really into like sort of uh, the Victorian era. Made my own outfit, like a steampunk type outfit and things like that. Never been able to do any work like sort of in that sort of era. He asked for a panel of Jack the Ripper fighting a demon. And although Jack the Ripper don't appear in the story or anything, it was just to sort of get the flavour and the idea of what, what he was going for without sort of revealing too much. And I thought, well, I want this job. So instead of doing a panel, I did an entire page and made it into a little story. <laughs> which is very unfair to all the other people, I think, that were going for the job. But So, yeah, I just did this sort of, like, in a graveyard and Jack the Ripper was fighting this demon. And then on the, the last sort of two panels, he sort of stabs this demon and he's got his hand on his face. And then the next panel, it's a woman that's got her hand on his face and she says, thank you. And it was just, like, just made it into a tiny little short story and it's like, oh, maybe, you know, Jack the Ripper, like, oh, he's, these people were possessed or something like that. Nick seemed to like it. Then we started to go on from there and develop the idea ideas and the, the characters and originally the, we were going to do the graphic novel as pencils and inks that's what it seemed like for the budget and for the time and stuff like that as we started to develop the characters and I designed them in colour we realised that you know it would be doing it a disservice to sort of do that because to capture that atmosphere the foggy misty creepy cobbled streets and things like that like London itself is, is its own character and so we really wanted that atmosphere and we had to do it full colour it was the only way it was really going to come across properly that's always something fascinating like building a world as you have Nick and, and the fact that you're bringing it to life through your art, Mike, as well, too. I think that's wonderful to see. But what's most misunderstood about the Victorian era that maybe the rest of the world doesn't quite understand? I think the poverty and the grime, it was a really tough place to be. In the 70s when I was growing up, a lot of London, it's not like it is now. If anyone's been to London, it's all tower blocks and fancy, you know, a lot of money been invested. In the 70s, it was still the remnants of a lot of Victorian London. There were cobbly streets and the old wharfs that, that used to have all the factories in and the big old machinery and stuff. When you look at that, and then I, I've done a lot of research into, well, before I started writing the, the novel, I've done a lot of research into the Victorian London. And it was a terrible place, some of it. You know, really, really poverty stricken. And then it made me think, you know, what would it have been like, really, if there were these underground demons that public didn't know about and there were these people that kept them at bay people could get picked off anywhere and no one would notice if they'd gone missing it just seemed a perfect sort of setting as well what is your creative kryptonite oh coffee and fags or cigarettes <laughs> in america oh well cri well kryptonite oh for me just not having any downtime i feel like i mean really what you're doing when you're, when you're being creative is amalgamating everything that you've experienced uh, throughout your life things like that and i think sometimes if you try and just focus in on what you're doing don't you know have a look at anything else or you know watch any new films that are coming out that tends to the well runs dry so i imagine yeah i'd say it's that for me what has been the the reaction from the people that have been able to read the first issue in terms of of the series itself and how are you going to outdo yourself in issue two well it's been <laughs> it's had a really really good reaction there's a scene in it that is quite disturbing and a lot of people most people comment on it i've had people that are, are really established comic book writers and illustrators and i'm not going to name drop they've said that we was reading it we really enjoyed it and then we got to this bit and you, you just took it to another level Although the part that I'm talking about was really hard for me to write. You know, it's disturbingly shocking, but there's nothing in it for shocking sake. Everything that's in there has a reason that it has to happen. It's a, been a really, really good reaction. We've had a few people that didn't get it, but very few. But mainly, uh, it's getting a bit of a cult following now. And we've got people that follow us on all social medias. I call them London Gothicers. And I say that they've been London Gothic-fied because... <laughs> When they've read the first one, they just go, oh, no, you know, they'll send me emails and, and stuff like that or messages on the social media. So we just want the next one now. What's happening? What's going on? And I can assure you that it doesn't get any tamer. <laughs> <laughs> As far as the art goes, I drew it all in order. And to be honest, I feel like the end, the end of the first one looks better than the than the start of it. Because I'm doing everything. I'm doing the pencils, the inks and the colours. My artwork got better as it went along and chapter two is looking way better than than chapter one at the moment now. So That's because you became one with the characters as well. Once you start designing those characters and illustrating, any illustrator you find, and I'm getting really into the graphic novels now. I never was before, but I am now. 
and you can see how they progress and and it's a lovely journey you can take people on with with that if you have a long-standing working relationship with a fellow illustrator and artist whether it's from the big two or whether it's independent you'd love to see a style evolve as well too because you're not going to stay the same way throughout the years either. I mean, I think that's why we appreciate art and famous painters or how we appreciate fellow comic book uh, artists and creators. Yeah, definitely. Most definitely. What was the hardest, you kind of hinted at the hardest scene to write, but for you, Mike, what was the hardest scene for you to draw? I'm not sure. I think a lot of the environments are difficult. Obviously not a lot of photographic reference really for Victorian London. The amount of environments are so varied and we really wanted to stick close to reality and make it as authentic as possible. I had to do a lot of research for like building references and, and things like that. Mostly the environments I would think, but we've really gone detail with it. I mean, we have seen in the sewers drawn some metal piping and I thought, did they have metal piping in sewers in Victoria? So then I went down a rabbit hole researching that. I think Nick mentioned it. And then I looked into how they actually made them. They had like these rivets and coiled the metal sort of. So like I made an slight adjustment. I think we got a little bit obsessed with making it as realistic as possible. <laughs> yeah, we wanted it to look good, really good. So the reader gets that full experience. The most obvious way is there's no narration in it. My idea was when I spoke to Mike, I want the reader to read it as though they're seeing it on the TV. So you could imagine it as you're looking at a series on the telly. And that's exactly what he did. Just worked his magic. I always call him Mike the Magician because he works his magic on it. In the beginning, I used to say to him, we'd have lots of discussions and he'd send me pages of art. And I'd go, no, don't like that. Change this, change that. That don't look right. This don't look right. And it only took about three or four pages. And then he was on exactly on the same wavelength as me. And everything he sent through, he was making it better than what I'd actually imagined. That's the great part about a wonderful working relationship. Money aside, it's if you can find the creative wavelength of each other, I think that speaks more volumes than what people are who are more established uh, can ever create. Yeah, it's, and, and it's just taking the time. When someone spends their hard-earned money on a, you know, it doesn't matter how much it is, but when they spend their hard-earned money on something that you've created, you really want to give them the best that they're going to get. And that's what we've tried to achieve. How does Mike elevate yourself as a creative person, Nick? Mike, how does Nick elevate you? He doesn't elevate me at all. I've become <laughs> a manic depressive since I've met him. <laughs> <laughs> and an uh, alcoholic <laughs> yeah yeah no yeah nick just uh, tells me tells me to work harder and longer so that's that's how he elevates me. he goes what you what you're sleeping you're sleeping get some more pages done <laughs> we've actually got such a good relationship now where we've been together for what it must be over two years isn't it i think and, and we've yeah, done probably, comic cons yeah. and shared a room so i've had to listen to his story. yeah we don't talk about that my so, story yeah. We just get on really well. I can be not blunt, but I can be quite direct in what I want. And Mike knows it now. So he just does it before I ask because he don't want to get shouted at. <laughs> in seriousness, we do sort of like, we'll often have like video calls and talk about certain scenes and things like that. And I think also Nick sort of trusts me to, you know, if I want to change the pacing of something or move a few things around because I'm a bit more knowledgeable on comic books and what might work better. So it gives me that freedom and he trusts me to do that now and i remember originally i'd, I'd sort of say oh well can we do it this way because this will sort of play out better if we change these panels around and then now i'll just do it and then send it to him and yeah he probably don't can't even remember it's that long ago since he wrote it i just get away with it so <laughs> Mate, i'm so old i can't remember what i've done this morning <laughs> <laughs> if you can remember what you had for breakfast that's a good day can't <laughs> <laughs> what was an early experience where you learned that language had power for me, definitely growing up in London, because from an early age, the first thing you do is learn how to swear. And everyone does it. It's just a normal thing. And it seems to be when you was around other people, if like your mum and dad took you to your posh uncles or your aunts, you was like, now don't say anything. Don't say anything. Get you in trouble. So you'd be all like, oh, okay, yeah. But now it seems like everyone does it. It's grown out of the capitals and just everyone does it. So, yeah. That's why there's a lot of it where it's needed in London Gothic. You know, we've got characters in there that, that swear a lot. We've got some that don't swear at all because of their, like the Duke is sort of a Duke. And he's got that upper class, what you would call maybe awe about him that they don't, they never used to swear in them days, those people. Then you've got Jellico, who's Irish and just curses all the time because it's a done thing in Ireland. So it's, 
it's just like that. But I don't know. I suppose the first time that I realised I needed to uh, watch what I was saying was when uh, I made a teacher throw a TV remote at me. So <laughs> it was the nicest teacher ever. Really placid. Shame it weren't a telly. <laughs> <laughs> well. I mean, if it had have been, you might not have had an artist on the Gothic, so let's <laughs> Just one with a flatter face. <laughs> <laughs> or a messed up nose like I have. Uh, <laughs> what about from more of an artistic perspective in terms of finding language in art? I mean, my dad sort of raised me on comic books and I was sort of drawing from a, a young age. And I think in the 80s, he did his own comic book. It was always a thing... I mean, it wasn't a big comic book, but it had a little bit of a cult following. It always just seemed natural to me, like, that I would do my own as I was growing up, just because, you know, my dad had done it already. So I suppose uh, from an early age, reading those comics that he made himself, I think that made it obvious to me that, it, you know, you could, anyone could do it. Uh, it was called Quantum, and it was a fanzine that had two stories in it, superhero type stories. And one of them got ripped off for a film called Star Kid, and we're sure that they ripped it off. It was in the 90s. It didn't do very well. But it was the exact same story story is one of, one of his stories in his comic. And he even says the character, when he gets this suit of armour from this alien and he gets his powers, uh, he goes, what should I call myself? And he says three different names and one of them is Starkid. And then the alien says, no, a name's been chosen for you. But yeah, this film came out called Starkid, exact same story, like literally. And we were like, we were, both walked out of cinema like, they, they read your comic, they ripped it off. <laughs> That's crazy. That's horrible. And it's nothing new to Hollywood either, because they do that everywhere. <laughs> Before I get into my introspective questions, and, and we'll talk about where we can find you and support you at the end of the interview itself here, um, is there anything that I haven't touched on you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? We're just bringing out Chapter 2, which will come out late spring, which will be run across Kickstarter. We were successful on the first Kickstarter, so we're going to do Kickstarter again. But I've also got pre-orders on the website that will go on there. Other than that, we've just reduced or managed to reduce the cost to send copies to the good old US of A. That's, that's been a positive. Um, that's not been announced yet. It's first on this show. 50 bucks a copy. Now it's going to be more like 25 bucks. Oh, wow. So we've halved it. Yeah, hopefully that'll do well and we can get, get out to the audience in the USA because we've got more followers on Facebook from the USA than anywhere else. But obviously times is hard. So if you haven't got the money, you ain't going to spend out $50 to get a graphic novel is a lot of money. But, you know, 25 is is more reasonable price. Mike, brother, anything you want to showcase or share? I'm just working on London Gothic. And, yeah, I've got no time for anything else. So. <laughs> so, no, I don't think there's anything Absolutely. else, really. Keep on doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what, it will happen as well. I'm personally funding it, and it was more of a, like a thing for me to do and get done because it was my story that I wanted it to happen. So when we do, like, the Kickstarters and stuff like that, they help top the pot up so that we can develop little bits and pieces here and there. But no matter what, all four chapters will be done. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I have to say my dad. One of them having like 12,000 comics in the house. Uh, I got to read a new one every night and that's what made me get the passion for it and the, and the will to do it. And that's how I learned to draw was, was copying those comics. And, you know, so yeah, I'd have to say it was my dad and my dad's influence. I'd have to say from the point of getting London Gothic actually done, it's got to be my wife who just pushed me to get it done and said, I'm leaving you if you don't do this. <laughs> That always helps. My wife is also, she's a pagan witch. So she had a lot of influence in certain characters that are in there. I didn't have some of all the characters when I started writing it, when we was penciling it in books and stuff like that, you know, saying. So she helped me come up with a lot of the symbols and where you've got the occult and the witchcraft in there. She was guiding me on what was going on. Without her, there wouldn't be any London Gothic because I'd probably just be thinking... I'll spend that money on a new car. I ain't going to bother making some fucking graphic novel or <laughs> spending all my money. And the fact that if she watches this, you know, you'll get brownie points, right? She definitely watches them all to okay. see if I've had a car with her or not. <laughs> you didn't mention me. <laughs> Keep one of them. From a professional standpoint, you have created an amazing comic book with London Gothic. You are in the process of creating up to four more and who knows what you both will create in the future as well so professionally you're successful in that regard do you consider yourself personally successful i don't i don't no matter how big london gothic gets or small i'll still be the same i don't judge things by the success of them i judge them by how people enjoy reading them that gives me pleasure and if they really enjoy it and they ask me questions about the characters and the scenes and where are we going with it 
that makes me feel really good. But the success, no, I'm not really bothered. Whilst ever I'm able to just do art and that's my job, that's successful to me. But like Nick said, I mean, obviously it'd be lovely, you know, if it gets really big or something like that, but, you know, just getting to actually do art every day, that's success to me. Plus Mike's really young as well, so he's got a good life ahead of him. I'm nearly done mine. I'm not that young. <laughs> you, look, you look good for 54, mate. <laughs> yeah, but I've aged about 10 years doing London Gothic, so... <laughs> <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I don't know. I just make sure to not talk to him that often. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm your failure. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> when you fail, you have to just pick yourself up and keep going. I've had many failures. You just have to be strong and get back up there. And keep going and it's no different in life to, to making a graphic novel or a comic or anyone out not everyone's going to like it and in my view if they don't like it i always say fuck them <laughs> you know it's not everyone's taste so move on to the people that do and that's how it is really mate but yeah when you fail pick yourself up keep going don't give in yeah i'd echo that yeah i mean every failure you learn something from it don't you the more you learn the less you fail Alfred, when you fall over, you literally pick yourself up or something like that, wouldn't it, Batman? The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer, comic book writer, or artist in comics. They are finding their own path in some way, shape, or form and maybe even inspired them on that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Be true and don't be tunnel visioned. Don't get sucked into a world where you're just doing one thing. You know, if you've got a superhero comic one day and then you have this brilliant idea that you want to do a horror or a sky fire branch out don't be scared to do it don't get stuck in that realm just being passionate about what you do and taking chances and the other thing is, uh, what i would say is do something that is yours and if it has been done before or something similar has been done before put your your spin on it do something new you might not be able to to begin with you might have to do you know what you need to do to get your foot in the door but then do something fresh do something that people haven't seen before yeah you're right mate don't be scared don't be scared to do it doesn't matter how you feel if you don't feel you're good enough or your writing is not good enough or your art have a go because you never know until you have a go you could have the next thing that, that's the biggest thing in the world that people just love you just don't know if your life was a comic book or a film what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be oh christ it would be something like um the biggest fuck up <laughs> ever existed <laughs> and <laughs> and the soundtrack would probably be something by i don't know pink floyd comfortably numb something like that. <laughs> depends on what you're smoking um <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> I think mine would be it would be the bosses watching and it would be theme tune to saw <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn them webcams back on in your bedroom, mate. Sit, make sure you do an illustrating after this. I think that sounds like more of an after-hours show of uh, artists at work. <laughs> it's not nothing exciting in it, mate. It wouldn't make like the late night Channel X. Well, I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you both, uh, Nick and Mike, for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate your interviews on Two Geeks Talking. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you very much, mate, for having us on. Really appreciate it. Before I let you both go, where can we find you and how can we support you, of course, on the internet and social media? So we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you type in London Gothic, we're there. You'll see us. You can find us on www.london-gothic.co.uk. And we update that regularly. There's a, there's a shop on there. You can buy copies and hats and stuff like that. Uh, there's also a blog that we do. And we've just recently put a list up in the UK of all the comic cons that we're booked into at the moment. Uh, the ones we'll be attending this year. And there's quite a few. Yeah, at London Gothic. That's, that's me as well. So I check all that sort of stuff. I don't really have personal social media. So, um, but yeah, we, we both look on those. So. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the 
Word 2, not the number 2. And of course, our YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website because I am only one person. Give me a break, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And our podcast is back after 14 years, thanks to it being deleted off talk shoot. Thanks a lot, you bastards, which is two geeks talking dot podbean.com. And we've uploaded, or rather, I've uploaded the last 100 episodes from 2022. So take a like and subscribe and favorite on your amazing favorite streaming platforms, whatever those may be. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.